Victor. First of all, Victor Wickerhauser. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Victor, to, to, to have you here. Uh, Victor will talk about arbitrage and convexity in discrete financial models. And as always, we ask you to mute yourself out on your own and, and, and unmute at the end of talk or in the middle if you want to ask questions. Uh, Victor, the audience is all yours. Thank you very much, Wojtek. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see uh, people I haven't seen in a long time. So I'll begin by uh, uh, thanking Wojtek and John Benedetto and the other people in the Norbert Wiener Institute for organizing this. Uh, I will share my screen uh, to the prepared slides for this talk, uh, which <clears throat> Uh, is on, a, it, which will be a survey of some work I've had to do uh, to find theorems in a course I was assigned to teach. So I was told to teach financial mathematics and chose a book which seemed reasonable at first glance, but was disturbingly free of theorems. So my goal was to find some actual mathematics in this book behind the, the jargon. So the, the amount of computational material that's been devoted to this subject is huge. Uh, but in this talk, I'm just going to survey the results that depend on linear algebra and uh, convexity. So I wanna to get to two versions of the fundamental theorem on asset pricing for the case of discrete financial models. So I'll have to start with some jargon. An asset, uh, like a share of stock, is treated as a stochastic process. The value of the random variable is the price of the asset at time t in one of the states omega in some probability space. It's assumed that there is a present time at which the price is known it's constant independent of all the states. And then there are two classes of assets. One is riskless, which does not depend on the uh, state variable omega. And every other asset which does is called risky. And then a portfolio is just a weighted sum of assets. So this subject, financial mathematics, is concerned with, uh, it started out being concerned with the prediction of prices for assets, but that really doesn't work very well. So it has, it has morphed into extracting from actual market prices, which are kinds of experiments, uh, a model for what people's expectations are. And that's what the fundamental theorem on asset pricing really is. It's a way of extracting a probability density on the state space omega from a set of prices that you can measure at the present time. All right. So the simplest kind of models are discrete financial models where there are only two times, the present zero and some definite future one. And then we'll have just a finite number of states uh, for this future. So then we can do all our calculations using just pairs and vectors of prices. Uh, the uh, spot prices at time zero of the different assets AI, and then the payoff, which the market expects at the future time t equals one. And so we can think of a payoff vector as giving the expected, well, giving the prices in states one through n at the future time one of the asset. Okay, so then a market matrix well, just, well, a market, in fact, will just be a matrix which has M assets and an initial price vector, the spot prices. What you would pay for these prices, these things now, given the expected, expected payoffs or given the modeled payoffs uh, at the future time. And you'll notice that the top row is all ones, which represents a riskless asset and it has the fancy name of numeraire. It's also called cash. Uh, in, uh, it's, a, it's something in which everything else is priced, with respect to which everything else is priced. 
the existence of this numeraire has some uh, important mathematical uh, consequence. All right, so in a discrete financial model, any portfolio is represented by a vector of, weight, of weights and it has a spot price, which is just the inner product of that vector of weights with the price of each asset. And then it has a payoff vector, which will be the uh, payoffs in the different modeled states of big omega in the future. And now I'm going to try to keep the notation consistent here. So when I'm doing linear algebra calculations, payoff vectors will be row vectors, and then spot price vectors, portfolio weight vectors, and probability mass functions will all be column vectors. But that, of course, is only one of the several possible conventions. All right. Now, an arbitrage is a portfolio that yields profit without risk. And we're going to describe this using component-wise positivity uh, of the uh, payoff vectors. So what is component-wise uh, positivity? It's the usual thing. If you have a vector in Rn, you say that it's positive if all its components are positive. It's not negative if all its components are non-negative. And then this allows us to compare vectors, one strictly bigger than the other, and the one greater than or equal to. And then positivity is a property of orthants in Rn, which are special cases of convex cones. So we're going to make uh, use of theorems about cones and convexity in order to derive conclusions about uh, discrete financial models. So uh, in general, a subset of Rn is convex if convex combinations are preserved. And of course, any subspace of Rn is convex. A set is a cone if uh, positive multiples of any element are still in the cone. And of course, any subspace is also a cone. Then there are three special orthants that uh, I will use in proving these the, uh, the theorems. One is the non-negative orthant. That's a closed convex cone. If you take the point zero out, you get what's called the pointless orthant. And if you take uh, the interior of the closed orthant, uh, you get the open uh, convex cone of vectors whose uh, coefficients are all positive. Now, ah, we also need the notion of a dual cone. The dual cone of any set S is just the vectors whose inner products with everything in S are not negative. And then in a special case where S is a subspace, its dual cone is actually its orthogonal complement. That's an easy lemma you can give to your, uh, to your students. There's also a strict dual in which you require the inner products to be strictly positive. But then if S is a subspace, its strict dual cone is the empty set. And then if you start with an S, any S, doesn't have to be a, a cone or convex, but uh, its uh, dual cone and its strict dual cone are both convex cones. Now, for the special sets I introduced earlier, the non-negative orthant is, in fact, a self-dual cone. If you look at the, at the interior, the dual of that is the non-negative orthant. And the strict dual is the pointless orthant, non-negative orthant. And then if we take the pointless non-negative orthant, its dual is the whole orthon, and its strict dual is the interior. And then we note that the uh, uh, open positive orthon is its own strict double dual cone. 
that's easy to check. But a more subtle fact is that any closed convex cone is its own double dual. And I will sketch out the proof of this just to show where the uh, subtlety comes from. Uh, first, it's easy to see that uh, any closed convex cone is contained in its double dual. But the other direction requires the hyperplane separation theorem uh, to prove, or can be proved using the hyperplane separation theorem. Since Q is a closed cone, it has to contain zero. That's the limit of any element of Q uh, multiplied by lambda tending to zero. And so you can conclude that this separating hyperplane function, uh, it, which is negative gamma at zero is uh, positive, which means that gamma has to be negative. And then you can calculate what the limit of one over lambda f of lambda q is, as lambda tends to infinity for a point q in the cone. And you conclude that x transpose q is greater than or equal to zero from which you conclude that X is in the dual cone Q prime. But since B uh, starts out being in the double dual, that gives the contradiction that F of B is positive when it was in fact assumed to be negative by construction. Right? So the separating hyperplane or hyperplane separations theorem gives you this nice proof of the very general fact that the double dual uh, of a cone is itself. Double dual of a closed convex cone is itself. Hi, quick question about that. Yes, yes. So does that not hold for the strict dual? Uh, it does also. I'm going to state that later, but it's not proved using the hyperplane separation theorem because the hyperplane separation theorem requires a closed set. Okay, so it would work for the strict double dual. Yes, but the proof is different. Okay. Although, didn't you say the strict dual the, of something was the empty set? And I'm confused about if that would. Uh, this is why I did this for the double dual rather than the strict double dual, because you need the convention that the strict double dual of the empty set is the whole space. That's the problem. Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> Would an element in the strict in the in the set be also in the strict double dual if it had positive length because the inner product with itself is is positive? It has to have positive inner product with everybody. Oh, I see. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. All right. Good questions. Let me move on though. All right. So now I want to uh, uh, connect these notions of uh, positivity uh, with the jargon of arbitrage. All right, so an arbitrage is a portfolio which generates profit without risk. So uh, we're gonna classify these into three types. The first type is an immediate arbitrage. That is a portfolio that leaves a surplus as it is assembled. So the price of this thing is negative. You have money left over when you assemble such a portfolio. And you might ask, how are you gonna have money left over? Well, the answer is you do something that incurs obligations in order to end up with a surplus of cash. So you might borrow a share of stock and then sell it. That's called selling short, which will leave you with a surplus. However, you also have this obligation, you have to return the stock in the future, which requires say buying it back from somebody. Uh, and that might outweigh what you spent or what you got at the very beginning. But anyway, an immediate arbitrage is one that leaves a surplus as it's assembled. It's, it's uh, spot price is negative, but the payoff in the future is greater than or equal to zero in all states. So it never costs you anything to liquidate your liabilities in the future. And that is equivalent, of course, to the payoff vector X transpose A being in the non-negative ortho. Then the other kind of arbitrage 
an arbitrage opportunity is something that costs nothing to assemble, but may not leave a surplus. And it cannot lose value in any future state, but it does have a positive payoff in at least one future state. So uh, its price is less than or equal to zero. And it uh, has a non-negative payoff in all states with a positive payoff in some states. So that's equivalent to the payoff vector belonging to the pointless cone, k drop three. And then the third type of arbitrage is an expectation rather than a deterministic arbitrage. It's assumed to cost nothing to assemble, but has a positive expected payoff. So we're gonna calculate that expected payoff in this discrete financial model using a vector of weights, a probability mass function on the states in the uh, future, in the probability space omega. So the spot price is less than or equal to zero. And then the expected payoff, which is given by X transpose A, the payoff vector, uh, inner product, the probability mass function, that is strictly positive. Okay, so now uh, it's uh, a common assumption that assets are martingale stochastic processes which means that their expected value in the future is their current value. So this is not the most general definition of Martingale, but it captures what we have in, in this condition. The expected value of the asset at time t in the future is the same as its expected value now, which is of course the expected value of constant, so it's just its price now, given by x transpose q. And if that's the case, then you cannot possibly have a uh, less than or equal to zero spot price and a strictly positive expected future price. So there are no arbitrage expectations in any financial model that assumes assets are martingales. And uh, that is, like I said, a very common assumption. I am lying to you a little bit because financial uh, assets are not actually modeled by martingales. It's assumed that there is some riskless investment you can make, like putting money in the bank at a positive interest rate. And then if you discount the time value of money, that process is actually a market. But I'm going to ignore that because uh, it just introduces unnecessary notation for our purpose. All right, let me introduce a couple more cones. We have a market matrix A. We'll say that a profitable portfolio is one that has a non-negative payoff in all states. Uh, it may cost you something to put it together, but the point is in the future, it's uh, never worth less than nothing. That's equivalent to P transpose A being in the non-negative ortho. And then with a little thinking, you will see that the set of all profitable portfolios for a market matrix is actually a dual cone. It's this AK dual. All right, now let's talk about a strictly profitable portfolio. That's one that's a profitable portfolio, but it also has a positive payoff in some state. It, that's equivalent to its payoff uh, vector belonging to the pointless orthant K drop zero. And when you work this out, you can see that that means that a uh, that the set of strictly profitable portfolios is the strict dual cone of A times the interior K0. Okay. All right, and I wanna make a remark about the usefulness of cash, the mathematical usefulness of cash. If the matrix of assets does not have a numeraire, does not have a riskless asset, then there may not be any profitable portfolios. So for example, the very simple one asset matrix, a market with two states, you either lose one or you gain one in the future. That has no profitable portfolio. There is no way to assemble a portfolio here that will have a non-negative payoff in all states. However, if you include a numeraire or a cash as the zero row, 
then there is always an all cash portfolio, which is both profitable and strictly profitable. So we will always assume that our markets have a numeraire so that there is, so that P is non-empty and S is non-empty. And that's necessary for the proofs of these uh, fundamental theorems coming up. Now, the arbitrage axioms are ordered this way. If you have an immediate arbitrage, you have money at, the, at time zero, which you can put into the riskless asset because that exists in, our, in all our markets, which means that that's equivalent to an arbitrage opportunity. And if there is an arbitrage opportunity, then the expected value of the portfolio is going to be positive, which means that you have an arbitrage expectation. So we have this uh, ordering of the, uh, of the hypotheses. Now, the economists uh, assume that everybody wants profit. And so there is an infinite demand for arbitrages, which generate prof profit without risk. And that means that if assets are freely traded, prices must adjust to consume any supply of arbitrages. And uh, they will, ass will assume that they adjust fast enough so that they, all this happens between the two time intervals now and the time one in the future. And we can state the assumption as an axiom, there are no arbitrages of any kind. So the non-existence of arbitrages has the reverse set of implications. There are no arbitrage expectations, means there are no arbitrage opportunities, which means there are no immediate arbitrage. And so the usual assumption in mathematical models is that there are no arbitrage expectations, that asset prices are martingales. And then you can use these other axioms, the non-existence of opportunities or immediate arbitrages uh, in uh, subsequent theorems, which is what I will do. All right, so let's state the no arbitrage axioms for no immediate arbitrages. We say that a market with prices Q is immediate arbitrage free if any profitable portfolio must have a non-negative price. So if X transpose A, the, the payoff vector is in the non-negative orthant, then the uh, spot prices have to be non-negative. If they were negative, you'd have an immediate arbitrage. And then the stronger hypothesis of no arbitrage opportunity says that if the payoff <clears throat> contains a strictly positive state, then the price of the portfolio must in fact be positive. So now let me state the fundamental theorem on asset pricing. It is that in an arbitrage free market, the price vector must be a weighted average of the payoffs in all the modeled future states. <clears throat> uh, stated precisely, a market A with spot price vector Q is immediate arbitrage free if and only if there is a non-negative vector K such that the spot prices are just uh, averages using the weights K of the, ex of the modeled future prices, or Q equals A times K. All right, so uh, before I go into this proof, which I will uh, look at it through using two methods, uh, let me note that this vector K is what we are really interested in. Uh, we would like to use the uh, spot prices today in order to figure out what people think the future, what are the probabilities of the payoffs for these various assets. So the information about the future really comes from this vector K, which contains the combined wisdom of anybody participating in this market by buying and selling. But for now, <clears throat> Let's go back to just the pure linear algebra here. Let's look at the uh, two directions 
of this theorem. Okay. If we have a vector k uh, that's with all non-negative components uh, and it gives q as a times k, then any profitable portfolio x can be written, uh, Hattel satisfies that x transpose q, it's the spot price, is x transpose a k, which is x transpose a times k, which is non-negative because every coefficient of x transpose a is non-negative and every coefficient of k is non-negative. And that means that uh, the market is immediate arbitrage free. If I go back to the previous definition, it's exactly this. X transpose A is in K implies X transpose Q is greater than or equal to. All right, now the other direction requires a little more work. Let's suppose that we have a market which is immediate arbitrage free. Then we'll notice that uh, A times this non-negative orthon is a closed convex cone. The profitable portfolios for the market are the dual cone of AK, which you can just work out. And then the market prices, the spot price vector Q must be in the dual of the profitable portfolios because of the immediate arbitrage free axi uh, hypothesis. For every profitable portfolio, uh, x, x transpose q must be greater than or equal to zero, which means that q is in the uh, dual cone of p. And then put these two things together and you get that uh, q, which is in p prime, is the double dual in the double dual of a k, which is just a k, since the double dual of a closed convex cone is itself. And from this, you may conclude that uh, there is some k in the non-negative orthon, which gives you the spot price as q as a, a weighted average of the payoff price. All right. <clears throat> so this theorem, the fundamental theorem of asset pricing, was originally proved as a consequence of Farkash's lemma, a result from uh, optimization, convex optimization theory in 1902. And I just, so that you recognize the kind of machinery that was brought to bear on this problem, uh, I'm going to state Farkash's lemma and then show you how it was proved as well. So Farkash proved this dichotomy if you have any matrix uh, and any column vector, the same number of rows as the matrix, then exactly one of the following must be true. Either there is a, a vector X such that X transpose A is greater than or equal to zero, which in our case corresponds to a profitable portfolio. And X transpose B is less than zero which in our case corresponds to the portfolio being an immediate arbitrage. Or there exists some Y such that B is equal to AY and the Y has non-negative entries. So this is exactly the statement of the fundamental theorem on asset pricing for immediate arbitrages. You exclude case X by excluding uh, immediate arbitrages, then condition Y must hold, which means that Q equals A Y. B equals A Y with B equals Q. All right, and Farkash's lemma was proved uh, again by exactly the same method. It's, it's a little bit, it's just slightly different. Uh, <clears throat> in order to uh, you start by showing that X and Y cannot both hold because that would lead to this contradiction. And then condition Y holds if and only if B is in the uh, column space of A, uh, or rather if B is in this 
cone, which is the image of the non-negative orthant under the matrix A. So if a condition Y fails to hold, it has to be that B is not in this closed convex cone, but you can uh, find a separating hyperplane then between B and the closed convex cone. And you repeat the same proof we went through to show that the double dual of a closed convex cone is itself. And conclude that, uh, and get this contradiction. And so you, uh, uh, that finishes the proof of Farkash's theorem. Yeah. I guess to finish this off, I should show you uh, how all this really rests on just the hyperplane separation theorem. So that applies to non-empty closed convex sets. You use the cone property uh, in the uh, proof of the consequences, Farkash's theorem, the fundamental theorem, but the hyperplane separ separation theorem applies to non-empty closed convex sets. Uh, and it gives you a normal vector and a constant defining a hyperplane as the zeros of this function. And I'll skip over the details here, but just point out that uh, you get explicit formulas for the normal vector just by minimizing the distance function to the closed convex set, which has a minimum calculus reason. And then, once you find the nearest point to the outside point B that's in the closed convex set, uh, that tells you what the normal vector should be. And from it, you also get uh, this explicit formula for the constant. The resulting hyperplane, the set of y's such that f of y is zero, is in fact normal to the line between B and the nearest point Q zero, and it passes through the midpoint between B and then you do a little bit of work to show that this hyperplane actually separates B from Q. Uh, and that I was delighted to find is an application of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which gives you this first inequality and the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, which gives you the second inequality. And you can only have equality if Q zero equals B, which is impossible because B is a point outside the closed convex set and Q0 is a point inside. And then you conclude that uh, F of B has to be negative. All right. Then the uh, other part is uh, showing that every point inside the closed convex set has to have F of Q greater than zero. All right, now to get back to uh, Michael's question from earlier, uh, it is, also true that the in an arbitrage free market, an arbitrage opportunity free market, which is a stronger hypothesis than uh, no, having no immediate arbitrages, you get the stronger result that the weight vector is in fact strictly positive. So uh, I'll state that in a market with spot prices Q that is arbitrage opportunity free, there is going to be a vector K of all positive entries such that Q is given by a weighted average of the states in, uh, of the uh, uh, expect of the uh, modeled payoffs uh, in A. And the proof of that is just like the proof of the first fundamental theorem. Uh, you show the uh, backwards direction easily. And then the forwards direction, you observe that uh, S is A's times K zeros strict dual. And then you note that Q is in the strict dual of the strictly profitable portfolios. And then you use the fact that uh, Q is in this strict double dual, which is the set AK zero from which you conclude that there must be some K with strictly positive coefficients such that Q equals AK. 
All right. What is the application of this theorem? Well, the existence of the vector k, once you normalize it to have a unit sum, it shows the existence of a risk neutral probability mass function. That's what it's called. I'm not going to talk about why it's called risk neutral, but it is a probability function on the uh, modeled future states, which is determined from the spot prices of assets given modeled future prices. And once you have that vector k, if you construct any other asset and uh, from say a contract to pay or collect amounts depending on the values in the future of the assets modeled by A, let's call that a derivative asset with a future payoff vector D, then the proper price for that derivative asset is just the uh, D transpose times K. Take the uh, modeled payoffs of D, multiply by the weights associated to those uh, modeled states, and that tells you the proper price, the no arbitrage price, as it's called, for the asset today. So this has applications to financial institutions that want to sell you derivative assets. Uh, they construct these things, uh, and they are called generally contingent claims because they are in the form of a contract, if you wish, that depends on the price of something else. A contingent claim is, in fact, a contract to pay or collect some amount, which depends on the price of underlying assets, which are the stochastic processes modeled by the market matrix A. Well, examples you might all have heard of are a call option, which is the uh, the right, but not the obligation to buy an asset for a stated strike price at some stated time in the future, or maybe before. Put option is the option to sell that asset at a, an agreed price. A swap is an exchange of one sequence of payments like interests from uh, a loan for another sequence of payments with different terms or a future, that's a contingent claim to buy an asset for a stated strike price at a future date. All those things depend on some underlying assets, uh, prices, and they, they should have a price that you could calculate today. One that won't lose you too much money or that will not be so expensive that maybe somebody would be willing to buy it. Now, once a financial institution has sold a contingent claim, they are on the hook for any liabilities it might uh, incur. So what they like to do is to construct a hedge, which is another portfolio, <coughs> a replicated portfolio of other assets that will equal or exceed the cost of the contingent claim in all the modeled states omega. So this can be stated as a positivity uh, assumption. So if C is the cost vector of the contingent claim, namely what it would cost the financial institution to settle any liabilities they incur by selling the contingent claim, then a hedge portfolio H over the market A is a, a vector that satisfies H transpose times the market uh, vector it has to be component wise greater than or equal to C. In no state in the future will the value of the hedge be less than the costs incurred by the contingent claim. So uh, <clears throat> the cost of the hedge portfolio, which the financial institution has to buy today, uh, if the spot price vector is Q, is H transpose times Q. Now, there is a second fundamental theorem of asset pricing, which is called the fundamental theorem on complete markets, which I won't state, but I will tell you what a complete market is. It has enough assets so that any contingent claim can be hedged exactly, which just requires that the row space of the market matrix is all of Rn. 
That's because your contingent claims can be absolutely anything. The imagination of humans is unlimited when it comes to constructing such things. So you need to have uh, the ability to hedge any vector in Rn, any payoff vector. And that requires that the market have a, 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 a row space that's all of Rn. But the row space is dependent on the discrete financial model. So you can't guarantee uh, completeness without additional assumptions. So we'll make one super strong additional assumption, which is that there's only one asset besides the riskless one, only one risky asset, A1. And it's risky, so you'll assume that A1 in state one has a different price than A1 in state two. Sure. And we'll assume it has a numeraire or a riskless asset in the first row, the zeroth row, whose value in both states of the future is the same. And then you can tell by looking at it that this matrix is invertible. And therefore its row space is all of R2. You have to have a numeraire and a single risky asset and only two states. And then you get a model that's obviously complete. So this is why binomial models in finance are so popular. They have this lovely problem. In fact, uh, in such a model, there is a unique hedge for any contingent claim on the underlying asset. Yeah. So by the way, in, you know, binomial models work fine for uh, contingent claims based on a single asset. The uh, hedge portfolio then is just a, a, fra a number of shares of the risky asset plus a certain amount of cash in the bank. And then <clears throat> a financial institution maintains this hedge by shifting money from the bank account into buying more shares or selling shares and putting the money back in the bank. And it continues doing that depending on how prices evolve until the contingent claims expiry date. That's how it covers its uh, risks. Now, the general case where you have many model states in the future, more say than you have assets, is an incomplete market. However, it's still possible to construct a hedge portfolio, only now it becomes an optimization problem. You wanna minimize the cost of the hedge portfolio subject to the conditions that it's a proper hedge. It actually is worth at least as much as the contingent claim at the future time. But the buyer of the contingent claim, he looks at what you're offering and compares its price to an alternative portfolio that is uh, worth at least as much. That person's the buyer uh, optimization problem is, wants to find what's the maximum price that he should pay for a portfolio that is uh, uh, that is no better than the contingent claim. So let's put it this way: if the uh, uh, right, if you have a portfolio K, which has a uh, <clears throat> a payoff. Uh, that's uh, no better than the payoff for the contingent claim, then you probably shouldn't buy it. So this maximization problem is the highest price you should pay uh, for something <clears throat> that is uh, no better than the contingent claim. Both of these problems can be solved by linear programming. They're convex optimization problems precisely because the sets over which you are maximizing are convex. Now, if the market is arbitrage free, then you can prove that the lowest price for the seller is greater than or equal to the highest price for the buyer, which gives a bid ask spread. The bid price from the buyer of this contingent claim is going to be less than or equal to the ask price for the seller of the contingent claim. And that's an easy consequence of our inequalities. We have a profitable portfolio. It has to have a non-negative price. 
So X transpose A is greater than or equal to zero implies X transpose Q, the spot price is greater than or equal to zero. Now let's let X be the difference of the portfolio solving the two hedge optimization problems, H for the seller and K for the buyer. Then X transpose A has to be uh, greater than or equal to zero because if we take H transpose A, that's less than or equal, sorry, that's greater than or equal to C. And K transpose A is less than or equal to C. So the difference is greater than or equal to C minus C, which is zero. So you may conclude that the price of the uh, seller's hedge portfolio is greater than or equal to the price of the buyer's hedge portfolio. And so this non-empty interval is the so-called no arbitrage bid ask spread for the contingent claim C. Let me point out that this is called the no arbitrage bid ask spread because if the seller were to sell a, the uh, a contingent claim for less than K transpose Q, then the buyer could turn around and sell it and make immediate profit. And likewise, if the buyer was willing to pay more than H transpose Q for this contingent claim, then the seller would have an arbitrage profit locked in at X proof. All right, so <laughs> this concludes my talk. I wanna point out that you can actually find these theorems if you dig hard enough in uh, somewhat more advanced books, The Mathematics of Financial Markets uh, by Elliot and Kopp, Farkash's original paper was uh, published in 1902. Uh, Hull has a nice book explaining how you construct contingent claims. And then there is a, a nice book specializing in discrete financial models uh, published in 1997. All right, so I'll now stop sharing the screen. And take Thank you, Victor. Questions. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for, for, for you to unmute yourself and ask questions to our speaker directly.